Hello everyone and welcome back to another video. This is Eisenhertz and today I want to share my thoughts on sandbagging interaction. So without further ado, let's get started. In MTG, the term sandbagging refers to the concept of not casting your spells, mostly counter spells, in order to conserve your resources and make your opponents use up their resources. I've been playing Control in CH for years now and I've always preached that in a multiplayer free-for-all format you have to be really mindful on what you cast your interaction spells on. In my usual playgroup I'm already known as the Ultra Sandbagger and here is why. In CDH you're basically playing a 3 versus 1 game. At any point of the game there are either 3 people trying to stop you or 3 people are trying to stop an opponent that's trying to go off. So you always have this 3 to 1 ratio from active to non-active player. And this has a huge impact on how your resources trade towards your opponent's resources. I've talked about this before, but it's really important to stress this again. For every card you draw, your opponents draw 3 cards. Which means that you can't trade your cards one for one and expect to keep up a winning pace. Your opponents just have more cards than you do. What does that mean for your counter spells? Well, if we simplify it even more, every counter spell you cast has to cost all of your opponents at least one card. Or it has to deny access to at least three cards. And yes, I know that's very oversimplified, but look at this more as a kind of guideline rather than a strict rule. So yeah, ideally one counter spell I cast will have to deny all of my opponents at least one card or three cards in total. And if we don't look at our counter spells that way, we will fall into the trap of trying to police the table and eventually run out of resources and not be able to keep up a winning pace or controlling the board. Subsequently, we will not be able to hold up interaction anymore and one player will be able to sneak up a win, most likely the player that did not waste their resources. So let me give you guys a quick example of what I consider good sandbagging. Player 1 casts Silence, indicating that they are trying to go for a win. If the Silence resolves, the following payoff spell will more than likely end the game without anyone being able to interact. So the pot needs to counter the silence and also the follow-up payoff spell. Player 2 is aware of that, yet passes priority with a swan song in hand, knowing that swan song alone won't be enough to stop the win attempt and that swan song can also counter a potential follow-up underworld breach. Player 2 chooses not to cast the swan song, but instead to communicate their thoughts. Something like, okay, he's obviously going for the win, he probably has Adnos or Breach, so if we don't have at least two counter spells for silence and the payoff, we're going to lose here. Let me check what I have, or if I can do anything. No, unfortunately I have to pass. Just by communicating their thoughts and bluffing the intent to help out, player 2 has made everyone aware of what's going on and they basically prime their opponents. This is important, even if you play against experienced players who already know what's going to happen because it makes them focus on the threat much more and decreases the chance of taking risks or being greedy. Player 2 also has the advantage of turn order. They can use their position to priority pressure the players behind them to use up their spells, knowing that they have cards in hand and probably at least one other counter spell. In the absolute worst case, player 2 can just ask player 4 to reset priority and cast their swan song anyway. But for now, they just communicate their thoughts and pass prio. Player 3 doesn't take the risk and casts an offer you can't refuse, countering the silence. They are a little too impatient and don't communicate with the table, but they play responsibly by countering the silence. However, the pot still needs one more counterspell to deal with player 1's follow-up payoff spell. Knowing that, player 1 continues their turn by casting at nauseum, hoping that there is not a lot of interaction left in the pot. Player 2 passes again, baiting that player 3 or 4 will have an answer for the ad nauseum. Again, they can in theory ask player 4 to reset prior. Player 3 states that they are f6, giving away important information, and passes to player 4. Player 4 also doesn't communicate or even tries to reset prior. They simply cast a force of will targeting the ad nauseum. Player 1 reacts by hardcasting a fierce guardianship, using the treasures they got from the offer. Finally, player 2's time has come. They cast Swan Song, countering the Ad Nauseum and thereby stopping Player 1's win attempt. In this example, Player 1 cast 3 spells in total. Silence, Ad Nauseum and Fierce Guardianship. Player 3 casts 1 spell. 
an offer you can't refuse. Player 4 also casts one spell and loses another card through their force of will. Player 2 again also casts one spell, Swan Song. By A. Communicating the threat, B. Drawing out information and interaction, and C. Casting their interaction as late as possible, the final Swan Song drew out a total of 6 of their opponent's spells. This is a perfect use for a counterspell. They just traded one card for six cards. And if player one didn't have the Fierce Guardianship, player two would have even been able to save their Swan Song for later use, while their opponents just used up five of their cards. Now, of course, this example only works if you are first in prior order and can reasonably expect your opponents to have answers and give into prior pressure. But even if you are last in prior order, you can use your board awareness and communication skills to combat your bad position. Don't wait for someone else to take the initiative. You communicate the threat. You can go out there and state that your opponents shouldn't try to prior pressure you, because you can't interact, even if you actually could. Something like, okay, we all see what's going to happen, you can try to pressure me into resetting prio, but I can't help out here and I advise you guys not to be greedy so we don't lose here. This will show that you are aware of what's happening and your bad position, while also establishing that you won't tap out to reset prio. Now your opponents are more likely to interact earlier, because you probably can't, which will possibly allow you to save your resources. Okay, so you want to cast your spells as late as possible, and you want to draw out as many resources as possible and as much information as possible. But how do you actually know when to send back and when not to? Well, this is basically the masterclass of interaction and politics, so perfecting this is really hard. But here are some guidelines I use when I assess whether to interact or not. Number one, you need to know your opponent's decks and lines. If you don't at least have an educated guess on what your opponents are trying to do in their game, you will not be able to assess whether or not to counter a spell. You might be wasting counter spells on not so important spells, and you might not counter the spells that you should counter. So meta and deck knowledge is a huge factor in communicating threats and sandbagging interaction. Number two, you need to always be aware of your opponent's hand size, the game states and the graveyards. Who has how many cards in hand and what kind of deck do they play? Is there a Rhystic study in play and did someone just draw a ton of cards? Was there already a counter war and what counter spells were already used up by which players? Ask to see your opponent's graveyards and check for yourself which counter spells were already used up. This will give you a sense of who might or who might not have interaction left in their hand. Number three, check what kind of interaction you have in your hand and what kind of spell needs to be answered on the stack. A Flusterstorm might not always counter a Ad Nauseam, but it might help if someone else tries to counter the Ad Nauseam, the active player protects their Ad Nauseam, and then you can follow up with the Flusterstorm if necessary. Communicate this information, but be careful not to give away too much info. My tip is to be honest, but mindful of your words. Saying, I don't have any kind of interaction, when you actually do, will most likely lead to your opponents not believing you anymore. But saying something like, I can't counter the Adnos, but I might be able to assist, is enough information for your opponents to know that you have something. You might still have to use your Flusterstorm, but you might as well not have to. And even if you do, you just baited out another counter spell by another player. Number 4. Sometimes you need to be responsible. Generally, we want to interact as late as possible. But if there is a Vampiric Tutor on the stack, and you know that your opponent is trying to grab a dark side that will win them the game, you might want to use your mental misstep here. Again, be mindful of your opponent's hand size in graveyards. Communicate your thoughts. Something like, I think he's going to grab a dark side, which will probably win him the game. Does any one of you have an answer for that? Is a really good question to assess whether or not somebody still might have something against the dark side. If nobody reveals any kind of information, a responsible mental misstep might be the way to go here. But if somebody says something in the lines of, don't worry about it, or I got this, or let's see if they can pull it off, I still have a ton of cards in hand, then you might just get away with not casting your mental misstep. Number five, don't let huge payoff spells or card draw engines resolve, and make sure that your pot is on board with that. Anything that draws a ton of cards, either at once or over the course of the game, should never be left unchecked, because it will allow your opponent to draw into all the interaction they need, into all the disruption they need, and into all the combo pieces. Look at countering a Rhystic Study or the One Ring or Jeskis Will or Ad Nauseam not like a one-for-one -one trade 
but more like a 1 for 5 or 1 for 10 trade. You might deny access to one spell, but you're actually denying access to 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 more cards. Optimally, you'd of course also want your opponents to chime in here and cast their counter spells as well. But if you can agree in your pot to try to stop the value engines, stop the payoff spells, this will leave you in a much better spot over the course of the game. Number six, maybe try some niche pieces of interaction. We all know the staple CDH counter spell suite, but there are a lot of spells that a lot of people are not aware of and that will catch them off guard. I'm talking about cards like Stifle or especially Trickbind. Trickbind can be used as a super late answer to Dockside, Oracle, Nojila, Kinnan, Thrasios, Canrith, everything basically. When everyone is passing on the Dockside cast, you still have an answer for the Dockside. After everyone cracked their treasures to not feed the Dockside even more, you still have an answer. You just hit them with a trick bind and boom, you just have a huge tempo play. Same for Oracle. While everyone is fighting to not have the Oracle resolve, you just sit there, let everyone cast their spells, waste their resources and you just trick bind the Oracle ETB and leave one of your opponents with, with basically zero cards in their deck. Trick bind's split second ability is so impactful that I sometimes even tutor for it openly and have it as a kind of stacks piece in my hand. Nobody wants to run into that split second trigger counter, so people will not go for the win with Dockside or Oracle, or they will at least need a few more turns to get an answer ready, something like Grand Abolisher, Silence or Ranger Captain of Eos to protect their win attempt. Another great example I've seen a lot recently, which I think trades really well, is Shieldred's Edict. You cast one card and your opponents lose three cards in total. So you get a perfect score, one for three. That's exactly what we want for interaction, removal or anything. So let's wrap this up real quick. Try to bait out as many of your opponent's cards and as much information as possible before you interact. Ideally, every counter spell you cast should cost your opponents at least three of their cards. Try to communicate your thoughts on threats openly, so you prime your opponents and make them interact earlier than they usually would. But be careful not to reveal too much info yourself, so you can't be priority pressured. Be aware of your opponent's strategies, hand size, graveyards, used up interaction and card draw engines. Interact as late as possible, but always check if your interaction stops the threat or what might be coming. And of course, always try to check card draw engines and big payoff spells. And finally, keep in mind that we don't play against chess computers. Emotions play a huge role in a multiplayer free-for-all game. So don't overdo it. Be aware that you play against humans or you will run into a brick wall. For all of this, it's important to keep in mind that practice makes perfect. The more you try it, the better you'll get it. Finding the right spot between pressuring, communicating, bluffing and being responsible. And that's it. What's your approach to sandbagging, politics and priority pressuring? Please let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. If you enjoy my content and want to support me, make sure to like, share, comment and subscribe. Follow me on Twitter, hop over to my Discord server and please consider becoming a patron. It really helps out. I have different tiers set up so there is something for everyone. And if you too want to bring your game to the next level, please let me know. I provide one-on-one -on -one coaching. Just hit me up via DMs on Discord or Twitter. This is Eisenherz and Auf Wiedersehen!